And before I tell you more, here are two sound bites. One is from the 25th of February. The war had just started. Many accused Volodymyr Zelensky of fleeing the country, but the Ukrainian president went to the streets talking to his people. And the other sound bite is from 100 days later. The setting is the same, the people in the frame are the same, but a lot has changed. Всім добрий вечір. Лідер фракції тут. Голова офісу президента. Good evening everybody. The faction leader is here. The head of the president's office is here. Prime Minister Schmeigel is here. Podolyak is here. The president is here. We are all here. Our military is here. Citizens of society are here. We are all here defending our independence and our country and it will remain so. Glory to our male defenders. Glory to our female defenders. Захисникам. Слава нашим захисницям. You heard what Volodymyr Zelensky said. It has been 100 days, the war is still on, but fatigue is setting in. The war has brought the world a near daily drumbeat of gut-wrenching scenes. Civilian corpses on the streets, chaos in, tra in train stations, blown up buildings, and a war at Europe's borders. It's worst armed conflict since World War II. So 100 days in, let's shed some light on the death, destruction, displacement and economic havoc. As the war reaches a milestone with no end in sight, the first question is, what is the human toll? Nobody really knows how many people have died. There are conflicting claims of casualties by the government officials. Some are exaggerated, others are lowballing their figures, but they are all impossible to verify. And that's the other challenge. Estimates suggest at least tens of thousands of Ukrainian civilians have died so far. In Mariupol alone, officials have reported over 21,000 civilians dead. Meanwhile, Russia's last publicly, publicly released figures for its own forces came on the 25th of March. A general told the state media that 1,351 soldiers had been killed and 3,825 injured. And this brings us to the devastation. There have been images of relentless shelling. There has been bombing, a series of airstrikes reducing large parts of many cities and towns to rubble. Nearly 38,000 residential buildings have been destroyed. 220,000 people are homeless. Educational facilities were not spared either. From kindergartens to grade schools to universities, everything has changed. Thousands have fled their homes. But where are they going? The Ukraine war resulted in the worst refugee crisis in Europe since World War II. About 6.8 million people have been driven out of Ukraine. But since the fighting subsided in parts, 2.2 million have returned to the country as well. Currently, there are more than 7.1 million internally displaced people in Ukraine. It's a war between Russia and Ukraine, but one that has impacted the entire world. The economic fallout in Russia and Ukraine, the West sanctioned Moscow, hitting back at the crucial oil and gas sectors, Europe is finally beginning to wean itself from its dependence on Russian energy. Russia currently faces over 5,000 targeted sanctions. This is more than any other country in the world. Ukraine, meanwhile, has reported suffering a staggering economic blow. 35% of its GDP has been wiped out as a result of the war. As a major agricultural producer, it has been unable to export some 22 million tons of grain. It blames the backlog of shipments on Russian blockades and Moscow's capture of key ports. The fallout has rippled around the world, further driving up the costs for basic goods. Developing countries are reeling under higher costs of food, fuel and financing as Russia's invasion grinds into its 100th day with no clear end in sight. Ukrainians seem more determined than ever. They want to take back every lost inch of their battered land. On the other hand, Russia is counting on fatigue to settle in. The intensity of fire is preventing the Ukrainian forces from being rotated. They are losing soldiers every day. 
Ukraine is waiting for the West to tip balance, but it looks like they have, it looks like what they have not learned in the last hundred days is that this is a war that they are fighting alone. And with us on the broadcast this minute is Dr. Anna Matviva, a Russian affairs analyst with us from London. Uh, thanks very much for being here with us. Uh, it is a milestone, uh, but there's no clear end in sight. I want to begin uh, by asking you uh, for your assessment of the situation on the ground in Ukraine. If we are now on numbers, um, we should also look at uh, the territory holding. Uh, currently, 20% of territory of Ukraine is under Russian control. Uh, be before 24th of February, it was only 7% uh, that were controlled by Russia. So now we do see quite a significant territorial gain. We also see um, slow but steady day by day ground offensive by the Russian troops, they are taking more ground in Donbass. Both sides believe in a military solution and they believe that the war is on their side. So Russian military tactics have changed quite significantly. They also have to rearrange their command. Some people were fired, but intelligence gathering and operation planning has apparently quite improved. There is much more limited tactics, there are more limited goals, and the uh, current Russian tactics is to concentrate all powers, all uh, weaponry, all people on where there is success, and reinforce success with everything they have, and then move to Ukrainian side certainly relies on two things. A willingness of the population to pay a very high price for the war, so it's too early to talk about anything like war fatigue, and also seemingly endless support from the West with weapons, equipment, humanitarian, and uh, all sorts of other aid, and also hosting the population. So they think that they have a very large pot of resources behind them. The Russian tactics is to close on the Ukrainian troops and encircle them uh, within Donbass and make sure that they have some kind of fairly sizable contingent threat. They have not achieved that goal. They might not be able to achieve that, but they certainly are challenging Ukrainian army very seriously in that respect. Right. Would you say that Russia underestimated the strengths of the Ukrainian resistance? I would say that, first of all, they overestimated their own strengths and they overestimated their own commanders, uh, their planning, the way uh, Russia um, conducted the war, uh, because they have been accustomed to quite limited engagement rather than full-scale offensive, which requires combination of aviation, artillery, ground troops, intelligence, everything working in unison. I would say that that was the key thing, that they did not really know their army. Uh, their high command seemed to be quite demoralized at the beginning, and certainly the Ukrainian side has mobilized much and has been able to exploit weaknesses fairly early on. Right. I also want to talk to you about uh, the role of the West here. Uh, they uh, started out by issuing a series of uh, statements and then warnings and then several rounds of sanctions. But none of that has deterred Moscow. What does this tell us about the West, their unity and also the United States and its role? Well, the sanctions and especially statements of Western politicians on the war and about Russia paradoxically made in Russia perhaps the opposite effect than they intended. It had united um, yeah, a large part of society uh, behind the leadership because it is now presented as a proxy war of the West 
against Russia. It is supplying weapons and money and equipment to its pro proxy. So it is really a kind of a global war. So that's one of the effects. It is going to be a lasting one. The United States um, has a pretty cautious president in some respect, but also being uh, very much conditioned by political climate, especially among the elite in his own country. He doesn't want to go down history as President Carter. Um, he wants to be um, Reagan number two, really global leader who acted decisively in the time of need. But on the other hand, um, we have unprecedented uh, transatlantic European unity, uh, which we have not seen before. So in terms right. of global identity, it's important. But it has made very little difference to actual ability to stop the war. Right. Dr. Matviva, we're leaving it there for the moment. Thanks very much for being here on the broadcast with us and sharing those perspectives and your assessment of where things stand. We are now available in your country. Download the app now. Get all the news on the move.